Did you know that throughout history, missions has been strategic in how God has changed the world? Uh, I want to just share a few thoughts. Uh, a lot of it is coming from this book on how God saved the world by Dr. Timothy Tennant. I'm going to leave the link in the description box below. It's just a significant book. It just, it's like in seven phases. It tells the hist church history from the very onset of the book of the Acts of Apostles till the 1700s, how God has moved and change the world through missions. And I really believe that missions is so strategic for what God is doing and what God is going to do. And so I wanna just share a few thoughts with you from the book that I believe uh, speak to us today and that we have to be intentionally and intentional and thoughtful as we look at uh, what God is doing. So it's gonna just be three main points. But let me start with um, uh, looking at a mirror. A mirror is a reflection. A, a real good mirror would actually reflect uh, your image with clarity, with precision. When you look at a good, a good, good mirror, ladies, you get that with me. When you want to have a mirror in your bathroom or wherever your dressing room is that has a good reflection of you because you want to go, you want to stand in front of your mirror and see how you truly look and how people from outside are going to see you. And so a mirror is just a true reflection of who we are and how we present ourselves but also missions that's how missions uh, is or has been over history and that's how the church actually is called to be the body of christ as the church of god as believers we are called to be a true reflection of who god is uh, one of the things we see in scriptures is that when God was to show himself to us or what God looks like, Jesus left heaven and stepped into history to show us what God was like. And in Jesus, we see the image of God reflected in a way that is real, in a way that is unique, in a way that is authentic. And so as believers, God calls us to go to the world and reflect that image of God to the world. That's what we are supposed to do, to be a true reflection. And, and that hasn't always been the case. Uh, there are times when missionaries have gone uh, to preach the gospel in places and instead of just really truly reflecting Jesus, we have reflected other things. We've taken our culture and been brought a reflection of the culture instead of the gospel. And so I want us to look at these three examples of people who truly reflected uh, of, 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 sorry, examples of a people, a group of people who truly reflected Jesus and how that truly changes the world in ways that are unique. And let's look at the book of Acts of Apostles, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. The Bible says, uh, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So uh, for us to be a witness, to be, it's almost like to be a reflection, to be someone who attests of the glory of God, of the goodness of God, of the salvation of Christ, and of just everything that Jesus had done. That's what we are called to go and represent, the glory of God, the salvation of Jesus Christ on the cross, uh, a true image of who Jesus is to the world. And so we have uh, these two disciples in scriptures that I would say they were the first cross-cultural missions. Uh, it's not something I truly actually ever I thought of. I thought of Jesus being the first cross-cultural missionary because he left heaven to earth. But apart from Jesus having that image in the New Testament context, because we have Abraham in the Old Testament who left his family and then goes uh, somewhere else as God calls him to leave everything to go. But then in the New Testament context, in the text of the Acts, in the Acts of the Apostle, when the church is burned, and then the missions movements really start uh, from Pentecost. We see two disciples. One is from Cyrene and the other one is from Cyprus. These two disciples who are actually unnamed. I think that's what is amazing to me. Two unnamed disciples uh, were part of the persecuted church. They have been persecuted and a lot is happening. And now the, the believers are forced to flee. So in chapter 8, persecution starts. Uh, Stephen is killed. The disciples scatter and they are running and everybody is going somewhere. What is amazing is that initially they start preaching only to other, Jew, or like other Jews. They are, they are limited. They are preaching to other Jews. But then you have two disciples, two unnamed disciples from Cyprus and from Siren who finally go to Antioch. And the Bible says they start to preach among 
some Greeks. Those are Gentiles. So they are the actual, actually like the first. Most of them will see Apostle Paul as the one who is the first person to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. But no, before Apostle Paul actually does, these two unnamed disciples uh, go to, Cyr go to, to Antioch and start preaching the gospel to the Greeks. And then the Greeks get saved and they are transformed. And it's actually them, it's actually them who lead the, the church in Antioch was actually formed by the work of these two unnamed disciples. I think that's impactful. That's just amazing to see and to hear. But the three things I want us to learn from the story of these two unnamed disciples will leave their cultural context, go to another cultural context, and then have to still take the message cross-cultural backgrounds uh, to be able to tell the gospel to a people who were different from them, a culture that was different from them, to make sure this message of Jesus goes across. The first thing is that as much as we don't want to romantize persecution, but if we see, look, I really look at the book of Acts, you realize that persecution in some way has had a significant role in the advance of the gospel throughout church history. Most often when there has been a lot of persecution, anytime the disciples, they're scattered. They have, when they go somewhere else, they are forced to preach the gospel to the new place where they go because they want to share the faith they have experienced. And it's amazing to see how much the church is growing in places that are persecuted. Uh, do you know that Iran actually is one of the places where the church is growing the fastest? I actually just wanted to research to see where the church is growing fastest around the world. Iran was one of them. It's, it's a persecuted place on the ground believers. They are preaching the gospel like insanely. So Iran is one of the places. India is one of the places, even with the persecution. China is one of the places, even with the persecution. Nigeria is one of the places. Yes, I know that in the south of Nigeria, there's still a freedom. But still, there are other places in Nigeria where there's a lot and a lot of persecution. And Kenya also. So if you look at these nations where the gospel is advancing like with so much speed, a lot of it is in the areas where there's persecution. So I pause back and I ask myself, looks like church history is repeating itself. Persecution, I don't know, it has, I think it has a way of making, bringing us back to focus what truly matters. At times when we get so comfortable and we enter into our comfort zone, we forget and we become so at ease and we forget what truly matters. And at times, as much as we don't want persecution, I don't like persecution. At times, that is what kicks us to refocus and reorient and see what truly matters. What, are the, what is the essence of this life and what God has called us to do? And how can we keep being witnesses of Jesus around the world? So the first thing we see uh, from these two unnamed disciples is that persecution was what provoked them or propelled them to leave their context and find themselves among in Antioch among these Gentiles. Uh, the second thing we see from these disciples is that they were ordinary believers. They were not one of the apostles. Their names are not even mentioned. Can you imagine that? They were in the periphery of when we talk about the church growth, about the church in that time in the book of Acts. They were not considered as one of the leaders of the church. But they were disciples who have been changed and transformed and impacted by the gospel. Missions throughout church history has been advanced by ordinary disciples. Ordinary people like you and I will believe in Jesus. We believe in this gospel and we are willing to tell our neighbors. And it's amazing how significant, especially the, the role of women have been in advancing of the gospel, in, especially in close nations or persecuted nations. Because most often it's, we, it's women, the, 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 we are non-threatening presence most of the time in spaces. There are places where a man would not be able to step in, but another woman can meet another woman and talk with them easily because there is just something about that. And, and so you might say, oh, I'm not a, a called a full-time uh, missionary, or I'm not called to be a pastor, I'm not called to this big role, I'm not on the platform. But what if God has placed you as your, at your job, at your workplace, to be that witness in that space where others cannot come in? Your name might not be mentioned in quotes, 
in the names of the bigs in the kingdom. But I will let you know that before God, that you are, your, the work that you do is valuable, is significant for the advance of the kingdom. And so I just want to encourage you today. You might not have a big name, but that your role is very significant. These were unnamed disciples in the periphery. And you might be really doing some incredible work. And for so long, you've been looking down on yourself and despising what you're doing. I just want to let you know that your work is valuable. Wherever God has placed you and he has called you to be a witness, keep being faithful. Keep witnessing. Keep being the light in that place that is dark and you alone understand the reality of that space. Keep being the light of Christ. Jesus needs you there. We need you. The church needs you in that space. So know that you are a missionary in that space that God has placed you. The next thing I want, I want us to see is that uh, the church of Antioch was actually a multicultural, cross-cultural church. Because when, when the, the Jerusalem Council met, the reason why the Jerusalem Council met, that's the leaders, all the leaders, almost like of the body of Christ, the apostles had to come together to like say, hey, as long as the number of Gentiles were few and you had a majority Jews, they didn't, they, the Jerusalem Council did not need to meet. But as the church continued to grow and became a lot more multicultural, multi-ethnic, there were some cultural issues that had to be dealt with. And so the church had to meet and like say, hey, how do we navigate this cross-cultural issue? What does it look like to be church, a church that is cross-cultural, that is intentionally multicultural, that is intentionally make a, making a difference with people that are different from us, but keep being true to the gospel? And, and I think that is so significant because throughout church history, missions most of the time is, is going to be cross-cultural. The church will have to deal with the cross-culturalness of what missions looks like. And I would say for, I'm an African, I'm a Cameroonian uh, by nationality and by birth. And here am I in the U.S. It's a cross-cultural context. I minister to people who are not just, who don't only look like me, who look different from me. So there is already a, an ethnic culture that is different. There is a race issue that is different. There is a language issue that is different. There is just so much that is different culturally. But as missionaries that God has called, it's our, our responsibility to navigate the cultural difference and see how can we be true to the gospel while respecting the cultural uniqueness of the culture that God has sent us to. And, and, and I think it's so important. It's beautiful. It's just beautiful. Revelation 7 uh, says that. I think that's one of my like scripture that I just incredibly like the most. Let me see if I can look at it and just read that for us. I love the text uh, because actually our church is working and we, uh, we started a cross-cultural church. We, we planted a multicultural church. Uh, last year, it's going to be one year this October, and it's been beautiful, it's been hard work, but it's also been just incredibly beautiful. Uh, forgive me, I'm going to have to wear my glasses so I can see. See really well. So I'm going to read Amma this for you so that you can just see how beautiful that is. Verse 9. It says, And I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, and from all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne, before the lamb clothed in white clothes with palm branches in their hands and crying with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the lamb and all the angels were standing around the, were standing around the throne and all the elders, the four living creatures, they all fell down to their faces and worshiped saying amen blessings and glory and honor and thanksgiving be unto our god forever and power and might be unto our god forever and ever but this six this text in verse 9 says people from every tribe every tongue every nation they were gathered before the throne uh, I, I i just like to picture before the throne just imagine every ethnicity imagine every language hispanics french swahili Oh man, which language? Are, Turkish. Every language, every tribe, every nation, every tongue before the throne, worshiping. 
But guess what? You know that that is only going to be possible when you and I actually choose to be witnesses to truly reflect Jesus where he has placed us. In some way, uh, maybe it's not persecution, but in a way, uh, there's been just such globalization and the ease of movement and people are traveling. So now maybe it's for school. Now it's people traveling to different nations for different things. And the church believers are traveling a lot. And I so believe that God is very intentional in this that is happening. That God has a purpose. God has a plan for all this movement around the world where saints are living from one nation to the next, that God has a mission. It's for the advance of his church, for the advance of the kingdom, for the gospel that we go to these nations. And like these unnamed disciples, be a reflection of who God truly is, the glory of God and the salvation of Jesus. And so my challenge and my charge to you today, how do you want to reflect Jesus where he has placed you? Which kind of mirror do you want to be? A one that is broken, a one that gives a true representation of who God is, a true reflection of who God is. Thank you for watching this video. If it has blessed you, I would like you to share it with somebody else. But maybe you popped onto this video and you don't really have a relationship with Jesus. It is so easy. All you need to do is to believe the Lord Jesus in your heart. Actually, the Bible says Jesus came, he died on the cross for our salvation. So no matter where you are, maybe you, you've never even heard about Jesus Christ. He loves you so much. He died on the cross for you, the forgiveness of your sins, for your redemption. And if you would believe him in your heart as Lord and as Savior and confess and repent of your sin, Jesus will forgive your sins. He will change your life. He will give you a new beginning. And maybe you once believed in Jesus, but you've backslidden. I want to call you back. Just like the master who goes for the one. Like Jesus loves you enough. And maybe that's why you stopped on this video. Because Jesus is saying, would you return home, my son, my daughter? Or maybe you're just, you're called as a missionary and you're just tired. You're weary and you wondered if your impact, if the work you're doing is making a difference. I just want to encourage you, Yes. Your work matters. Your voice matters. You might be that unnamed disciple, but God sees you. So stay strong. Keep pressing on. You are not alone on this journey. Uh, let me share with me your testimony, your story of how, the, how you've been working. Probably you're not, a, you're not a, your disciple that is not named, but you're, God has been using you to just create impact somewhere at your workplace, in the village, in the town, in the city, wherever. I'd like to hear your story. Can you share that with us in, in the comments below? You have a wonderful rest of your day. Let me pray for you. Uh, dear God, I thank you for this brother, sister, missionary, unnamed disciple that is watching this video. And I wonder if their work matters. I pray that you will remind them of how valuable they are to you. I pray for the one who is feeling weak and tired that you will bring strength to them. And for the one who just made a commitment to you, Jesus, today change their lives, transform them, give them a new beginning. Let them know that they are loved and precious. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. If you just gave your life to Jesus, uh, I would like you to send us a message. I'm going to put a message in the, in, in the comments below and we are going to reach out to you. You have a wonderful, a wonderful rest of your day. Blessings. Bye.